Welcome to another episode of 9 to 5 Mac Weekly, where jailbreaking is pretty much the only thing I do in my spare time. I am your host, Miles Somerville. Let's dive into the news. Probably our biggest story of the week is this new video that was recently leaked by Chinese blog Mako Takara, showcasing what could be the 2021 iPhone or iPhone 13. Take a look. Now, while I can clearly see that this mock-up is notchless and that is nice, I'm not really sure what to make of this overall in terms of design by the looks of it. It looks like we should be getting yet another lens added to the camera setup on the iPhone. Uh, and this mock-up was made based on data from Alibaba, so it's far from official. But if what we're seeing regarding USB-C is true, then we might have a killer iPhone coming in 2021. And everyone who said USB-C was never gonna be a thing on the iPhone, they might be wrong if this is true, but I guess we'll have to see in about a year. Coming back to 2020, unfortunately, it appears as though the iPhone 12 lineup likely won't be launching until quarter four. According to a report from Bloomberg, Broadcom CEO Hop Tan discussed the likely delay during an earnings call. During the call, he didn't explicitly cite Apple as the company experiencing the delay, but there's only so many major US companies releasing smartphones during the fall. So the general consensus here is that the iPhone 12 lineup likely won't launch until around October, which when you compare that to the iPhone 10 launch of 2000, 2017, it's not that bad because the iPhone 10 was delayed all the way until like towards the end of November. Uh, so overall, we're all looking forward to the launch this year. It should be a good one and it's only getting delayed by a little bit. Now onto the larger screen side of things. It looks as though Apple's gonna be going all out for the 2021 iPad Pro. According to claims by Leak or Love to Dream, the next generation iPad Pro is going to have the Snapdragon X55 modem, meaning it'll support both 5G standards. And in addition to that, it looks like the iPad Pro is also going to have a mini LED display. And throughout the year, we heard reports here and there of Apple starting to utilize mini LED technology and specifically on the iPad Pro or whatever iPad we were supposed to get this year. Unfortunately, due to all the delays, we're not gonna be getting a mini LED iPad this year most likely. So it seems as though quarter one or two of 2021 is when this tablet is gonna be making an appearance. But overall, the iPad Pro is a near perfect tablet in terms of the hardware. They just have to keep things up to date and try not to make any strange changes. And overall, we'll have another killer productivity device coming at us next year. So we've got another desk flex for this week. And if you're not sure what the desk flex is, it's essentially just a segment we do here on 9to5Mac Weekly, where you, the viewer, can submit a one to two minute video showcasing your Mac setup, and we have it featured on the channel. It's pretty simple, and instructions how to do that are linked in the description. Uh, but this desk flex is actually from the past as far as my reaction and review of it, because I wanted to watch it as soon as I got it. Uh, so let's take a look. Yo, what's up, 9to5Mac? My name is Victor Kamanga. I also run my own tech channel here on YouTube where I produce consumer electronic reviews as well as car reviews, which I recently started doing. So let me show you guys my setup real quick. Okay, so this is the most accurate representation of how my setup looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you literally walk on me walking, this is probably what you're going to see. I usually have a to-do list here with my notebook. I have my water bottle. You gotta stay hydrated at all times, even when you're editing. And then I usually have an editing software pulled up. I use Final Cut to edit. I'm actually working on a BLM video. Stay tuned for that. Um, and powering my setup is a mid-2017 MacBook Pro base model. I bought it last year. I got an amazing deal on it. I was upgrading from the MacBook Pro 13-inch, and it just wasn't handling what I was doing anymore. 
Um, I got it for $1,700 with free shipping and no taxes on B&H. It was such an amazing deal. No regrets at all. Um, for the speakers I used to monitor sound, it's nothing special or major or anything. It's an edifier. I can't quite remember the um, model number, but they're both under 100 for, for both speakers. And these are by far some of the best speakers I've owned for the price. And they have built-in bass, so you don't have to get a sub or anything like that, so they sound really great. I have this Satechi headphone stand, and on the headphone, headphone stand we have the Audio-Technica ATH M40X, and as you can tell here, they're pretty beat up here. I've actually been using these for almost probably four years now as my uh, monitoring headphones, and they work wonderful. The keyboard I use is the Magic Keyboard, um, or the Apple Keyboard, I can't quite remember which specific one it is. It's a wireless one. And then I have the MX Master 3S for editing. I use this majority of the times, and then every now and then, I'll switch to the Magic Mouse um, whenever I, I guess I get tired of holding the MX Master 3S. To record all the voiceovers for my YouTube videos and for some client work, if I'm working with a client that needs some voiceovers, this is a Blue Yeti X. Um, I was actually using the Blue Yeti Nano prior to this, and this was well worth the upgrade. It has so many different modes um, on here on the back that you can choose from. This is a great mic if you're looking for something for your podcast or even for your voiceovers. That is pretty much it for my setup. I hope you got some inspiration for something you can take with you for your setup. Thank you for watching. I look forward to seeing some of you guys on my channel. Bye. Wow, Victor, awesome setup. Thanks for submitting. Uh, probably my biggest and favorite feature of the setup uh, is that 15 inch MacBook Pro. It's such an awesome device if you want that workstation like power, yet having portability if you want to take it out with you when you're traveling and stuff like that. Also, notice that you've got the Blue Yeti X. That's a mic that I've been kind of wanting to check out, but I haven't had an actual reason to pull the trigger on one. But I had the original Yeti for many years and I still do. Uh, so I kind of want to check that out. And I love uh, the uh, backlighting with the uh, what I assume are just RGB LED uh, strips on the back of the desk there. Overall, it's a, it's a very clean setup. And he has a YouTube channel, as he mentioned. Go check it out. Thanks for submitting. In some even more iPad news, it looks as though the iPad Air is going to be making a major port change. According to another post from the blog site Makatakara, the iPad Air 4 is supposedly going to adopt USB-C for charge and sync. Now, this is a somewhat strange report because this is one of the first reports we've heard about an iPad outside of the Pro lineup adopting USB-C, but it's even stranger because the report claims that the next generation iPad mini is still going to retain lightning. I'm not sure what to make of this rumor as far as it making any sense, but as we've seen before, Apple and many other companies sometimes do things that don't make much sense at all. And now I don't have a problem with USB-C being on the iPad Air 4, but why put it on that tablet and not the iPad mini or the regular iPad? It's something I'm curious about. What do you guys think? In our last story, I'm pretty upset because right before I decided to jump the gun on a new MacBook Pro, Apple decided to make a pricing change. Uh, in what they call a pricing correction, uh, they changed the pricing option from upgrading to 8 to 16 gigabytes on the new entry-level MacBook Pro. It was initially $100 uh, when the 2013 inch launched, but now as of June 1st, it's $200 uh, to upgrade from 8 to 16 gigabytes of memory. Apparently, Apple did this in what they call a pricing correction to maintain consistency with the rest of the Mac lineup, and yes, that does make sense because the iMac, the MacBook Air, and the Mac Mini all have a $200 at 8 to 16 gigabyte memory upgrade cost. But when you look at the MacBook Pro in particular, the 13 inch entry level model, it's rocking the oldest uh, hardware in terms of memory. It's rocking like 2.1 gigahertz DDR3, which is, I don't think that's something you can really justify in my opinion, charging $200 for that. But hey, I guess this is what it's like to be an Apple user. But that's pretty much it for this episode. Thank you all for watching. I'll have every story that I mentioned in this video linked in the description down below, as well as some resources if you're interested in contributing to everything that's going on right now. Thank you all for watching, and I'll talk to you in the next one.